What's going on, smart people? A couple of videos ago, I went over how to take dot products of complex vectors, and I spent a whole video on that because today I want it to all be about Dirac notation. And the, the vectors that we use in quantum mechanics more often than not are going to be complex, so we needed to develop a theory of dot products between complex vectors before we got to today. But my goal for today is to take familiar concepts of regular vectors, like how they can be expressed as linear combinations of their basis vectors, and how to pick out components of those vectors and learn how to translate that into Dirac notation. And then we're going to take it one step further and develop a completeness relation in Dirac notation. But let's get start, let's get ready to Dirac and roll. Assuming you're at least comfortable with complex dot products if you haven't seen the video already, we know that if we have some vector v as that can be represented as some column vector v1, v2, v3, and we have some vector w that can be represented as the column vector w1, w2, w3, then we can take the dot product between these two, v dot w is equal to v transpose complex conjugated w. And we have a name for this kind of vector wherever we take the conjugate transpose, the complex conjugate transpose. So v star transpose is defined as v dagger. And this dagger means that you're taking what's known as the Hermitian conjugate. What's the difference between a Hermitian conjugate and a regular vector? Well, the regular vector becomes transposed, so a column vector becomes a row vector. So this would be v1, v2, v3, and you're done, right? No. And then you also have to take the complex conjugate. And what is the complex conjugate? Well, it means that any of parts of the vector that are complex the sign gets switched. If you're dealing with a real vector, the complex conjugate is just itself. What Dirac notation does is it says that any time we see this vector v that is assumed to be a column vector, that is going to be written as this v inside this little less than, greater than sign that's pointing to the right. And if we ever see v represented as the Hermitian conjugate, that is going to be the greater than, less than sign pointing to the left of v. So say we wanted to do v dot v. Well, we know that that is v transpose complex conjugated v, which is equal to v dagger v, which using this Dirac notation is v pointing to the left v. And we have a special name for these two vectors here. This is called a bra vector, wherever you have the arrow pointing to the left. Then we have this little column separating the two. And then we have the ket vector pointing to the right. So when you put it together, we get a bracket. So the thing to take away from this so far is if you have some vector that's represented by either a bra or a ket, the ket vector is always going to be the column vector, the normal one, and the bra is going to be the normal one, transpose, complex, conjugated. You with me so far? Great, now that you have mastered Dirac notation, I thought we could do a couple examples. We're going to take some vector algebra stuff that we know how to do the conventional way, not using Dirac notation, and then we're going to translate it into Dirac notation. The first thing that I want to start with is how any vector, assuming we're working with a set of orthonormal basis vectors, how any vector can be written as a linear combination of its basis vectors. In other words, if we take our vector v again, for example, it can be written as a sum over i of its components, its v i, uh, times the basis vector, which when you expand is you know, v1, e1, plus v2, e2 plus v3, e3. And if we're working in, say, Cartesian coordinates, that means that this is just vx i hat plus vy uh, j hat. Sorry, that looked like a z at first and I got confused. Um, plus vz k hat. Now, how would we write this in Dirac notation? Well, the first thing that we need to do is we need to establish how we want to write our basis vectors in Dirac notation because they're going to have to be in terms of column vectors. And our basis vectors, especially if we're using something like Cartesian coordinates, uh, e sub x should not have any y or z components. So the way that we're going to write this is we can say that the first basis vector can be written as this column of 1, 0, 0. So it's just got x and no y, z if we're using Cartesian. Similarly, 2 can be written as 0, 1, 0, and 3 can be written as 0, 0, 1. This should be equals, sorry, getting a little cramped. Um, so now let's just translate. 
So v would now become a ket vector, which is v, which is equal to a sum over i of vi, so nothing's changed so far, times our basis vectors, which is just again going to be written as our ket i. Great. So if we expanded this out, that would just equal v1, 1, plus v2, 2, plus v3, 3. So really nothing has changed here. This is actually pretty straightforward. Cool. So far, so good. The next thing that we want to do is I want to show you how to pick out, say, the j component of our vector. j just being an index, not saying the y direction. So if we want to find out, too, what is e sub j, the e, e sub j component of the vector, we can just take the dot product of the vector with e sub j, right? We can do e sub j dot v, which is equal to the sum over i, vi, e sub j, dot e sub i. And since I established earlier that we're using orthonormal basis vectors, that means that j has to equal i, or else this whole thing is zero, right? This here is just delta j i. It's, it's one if these two are equal, and it's zero if they're not, which means that this is just equal to v j. So for example, for example, if we want to do, say, e sub x dot v, that is equal to the sum over i of v i e sub x dot e sub i, which is equal to delta x i. So it's, it's 1 if x equals i, and it's 0 if they're not, which means that this is equal to v x. Great. Uh, now let's see how to write this in terms of Dirac notation. Two. Um, so our basis vector is just going to be j now. V. So we're using our j basis vector. And then that is equal to the sum over i of v i j i. Which again is just going to spit out a Kronecker delta. If this is continuous, then it would be a delta function, but we're assuming that it's discrete right now. So that's delta j i, which is equal to v j. Perfect. One kind of important thing to take away from this is the ket vectors were equal to these column vectors here, right? But we're taking the conjugate transpose of, of our basis vector. So it's going to become a row vector here, and it's complex conjugated. But since these are completely real, the complex conjugate is just itself still. Now the last thing that I want to do, I'm not going to do on this side because it's kind of hard to tell which one here we'd be referring to as the row and which one would be the column. So I'm going to do it on this side further, and we're going to develop our completeness relation. So let's start off with this definition again. So we know that v can be written as the sum over i of i times vi. vi is just a number. It doesn't matter if I write it first or write it second. That means that I can take the inner product of the i basis vector with v to give me v i, right? Because the inner product of i with itself is just going to be 1, which means that v i is the only thing that survives. Now let's take this definition and substitute it back into that equation. So we get that v is equal to the sum over i of i with vi now being this, which is equal to sum over i of i i v. So we get that the vector is equal to the vector itself times whatever this is. And what is this, is what I want to know. It, I mean, if it's equal to itself times something, then that has to be 1, right? Well, kind of. Let's, let's find out what this is. Well, let, first, let's see. Let's divide this up real quick. What I want to know is what does this kind of product even mean? So let's go ahead and just take 1, 1, for example. Let's do, what is 1, 1? Well, that's going to be equal to the 
column vector 100 times the row vector 100. I have a tendency to write these ones larger, and in the last video, it looked like a column vector, and I kept it as one, which was a mistake in the last video, but it was supposed to be represented this way. And someone pointed it out, so thank you for that. And this is going to be equal to now a square matrix. So it's going to be the first times the first, so it's going to be a 1. The first times the second, which is going to be a 0. The first times the third, which is going to be a 0. The second times the first, 0, and so on. You can carry that out and see that that's going to result in this square matrix. Similarly, we do the second and the second. That's equal to 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, which is equal to another square matrix. And if you carry out the algebra, it's going to be 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And lastly, we can take 3. to equal 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, which is going to give us another square matrix, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Fantastic. And then this is saying that we want to add all of these up. So we want to sum these three matrices together. And when we do that, what we get is that when we sum this up, sum over i, 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 that's going to give us just the identity matrix, which is why I said it's one, sort of. So what we've done here is we've established a completeness relation that the sum over i of this, which is known as the outer product, is equal to the identity matrix. And this whole relationship just would have been a little bit weird to establish in the normal notation. Instead, we would have had to do, instead of v dagger, uh, let's call it w, it would go to uh, v w dagger, or sometimes you might see the outer product denoted as V and then a cross in a circle times W. And at least in my experience in quantum mechanics, it's more common to use the outer product in Dirac notation than it is this way. Now I should say that this video on Dirac notation is by no means complete. There's plenty more that you can learn to do with it and I might get into the more advanced stuff in a future video, but I thought that this covered some of the basic stuff and what it was supposed to do was just serve as a little mini translator from regular notation into Dirac notation. We can get into the fancy stuff later, but I hope you guys found this video helpful and a little bit useful. Let me know in the comments section if you did, and I'll see you guys there.